This story takes place in an HOA, entitled Neighbors Demand I Fix My Fence, posted by Wobro. This one happened maybe about 10 years ago, but just came to mind. I'd purchased a house with my wife when I was about 26. We were definitely the kids of the neighborhood, but we were excited to get started making the home ours. All of our issues stemmed with one of the next door neighbors. This started with basic entitlement. The landscaping in the section of the property that bordered theirs was pretty horrific, made worse by how the previous homeowner stored their RV there. There were some paver stones creating a little walkway across our front lawn. We set about to fix this whole section first, moving all the old landscaping rocks, building a retaining wall, putting down landscaping fabric, and moving the rocks back. Took an entire summer, looks great now. Not good enough for the neighbor. The old lady says, I use that pathway when I walk between these houses. And I reply, well, hey, I would much prefer you use the sidewalk if you need to come to my door. Huh, well, when are you going to clean up the rocks on my yard? She wanted me to do the same thing I did on my side of the property to her section. Yeah, sorry, you're going to need to hire a landscaper. Fall rolls around, as does winter. She made sure to point out to me, the previous homeowner used to clean the leaves off of my yard and used to shovel my walkway and driveway for me. Yeah, maybe if she'd ever been polite to me, I would have considered helping out an elderly neighbor. So now the real story begins. It's the middle of winter and I'm keeping pretty busy being dad to our new baby and going back to school. It's finals week. We find a note on the door. Your fence has fallen onto our property, and we cannot get out of our house. Well, how'd you post this on my door? So I go out back and I take a look. <laughs> sure enough, a few sections of the fence have failed. It's leaning against their house, preventing access to the back gate. So I call my dad, and he shows up with tools in his truck, and we proceed to dismantle the broken fence sections, put up some temporary fencing, and clean up. I'm going to have to do some grading work and dig out the old concrete footers to fix this right. The ground is frozen solid, so this will need to wait. The next day, I hear some commotion out by the fences. It's old lady and old man. Wife and I go to see what's going on. As we approach, they are both standing out by the temporary fencing, scowling, shaking their heads no. Uh, hi there. This is not acceptable. Uh, what do you mean? We put this up for now, so, but you need to fix your fence. Excuse me? I need to fix my fence? Yes, this is not acceptable. This fence was here before we built our house. Total lie, her house was built before mine. This is public record, and I have documentation that shows this. It was provided to me during the sale. Okay, what do you mean? This should suffice for fine just now, just to keep the dogs out of each other's properties. You need to put up a six foot privacy fence. At this point, I'm just ticked. The fencing that borders my other neighbor's property has fallen before and we both work together and split the cost of the repairs. Oh, do I? Well, if it's my fence, I don't need to do anything. In fact, I could remove the rest of the fencing as you are claiming it belongs to me. No, you need to put up a six foot privacy fence. Says who? Not the state, not the city. The HOA says so. I have documentation stating that the HOA was disbanded 20 years prior. There is no HOA. It was disbanded in 1987. Then who am I sending checks to every month? Oh man, I have no clue, lady, but it's definitely not the HOA. Oh, it figures you wouldn't pay your HOA dues. You are the worst neighbor ever. I'm, I'm done here, lady. There is no HOA, and since you stated this fence is my property, I'll do whatever I want with it. The only requirement here is that I keep my dog out of your yard, and this temporary fence, it'll do just fine. The old man says, I'm going to rip this fence down, and then you'll see what happens when your dog comes onto my property. The old man is blind, but he has a very angry vibe to him, and he has NRA stickers all over his cars. I know what he's implying here. Sir. If you damage my property and lay one finger on my dog, I will have you thrown in prison so freaking fast your head spins. What did you just say? You come say that to my face. Yeah, right, dude. So I grab my wife and we walk back into the house. A few days later, code enforcement shows up. They come out and they inspect the fencing section. Code enforcement informs them 
there is no code that dictates any type of fence, and since he cleaned up all the debris, there is no code violation. Or is there? As I can now see, the old lady in man's backyard is 100% weeds. Some of these weeds are at least 6 feet tall. Some of these weeds are considered noxious, meaning that you are legally required by the state to kill them and remove them. So I send a letter to code enforcement, and the next day, I see the old lady scowling at me, trying to drag a trash bag full of weeds out of her backyard. I did fix the fence a few weeks later, after finals, when the ground had thawed out just a bit, and I could do it right. This story takes place in a terrible HOA. Wait till you see what happens. I have a quick story about an entitled grandma at my old condo. My wife and I bought a condo about 10 years ago. It was a good starter place, and it helped us buy our current house. We moved in while my wife was pregnant with our first kid, so naturally, I had a lot of work to do when we first moved in. Before we even moved, painted about half the condo, cleaned the carpets, replaced the two sinks, and made some minor repairs. This was a strange condo because most buildings had two-story units on top and single-story units on the bottom. Overall, this was a nice complex, and the HOA wasn't full of demon spawn. The HOA president was a nice woman who warned us that the insulation between the side units was pretty good, but non-existent between floors. We had a two-story unit, and the entitled grandma Karen was on bottom. So at first, Karen was nice. She could hear me working on the condo, and then came up to say hi and bring me some cake, because she figured I was working hard. We had a nice talk, and I told her about us having a baby and moving in. She told me that she had a grandson and how much we will like being parents. After the kid was born, she would wave to our daughter, exchange small talk, and so on. Normal neighbor stuff. Well, things changed that summer when we had a heat wave. My daughter was probably three months old at the time, and this condo was hot. For context, because of the layout, there were two windows upstairs, one in each bedroom, one in the dining room downstairs, and a sliding glass door to the deck. Of course, our daughter's room faced due west and was in full sunlight. We had great sun-blocking blinds, but we couldn't open her window until the sun went down and it was starting to get cooler outside. Otherwise, her room would be an oven. Even when we did this, it was 85 plus degrees on a regular basis. Our HOA allowed portable AC units with hoses to the window, but not window AC units, which are ones hanging out of the window. I was able to petition them to get a window AC for our bedroom because it faced a green belt so it wouldn't be seen. However, they expressly told me no window AC units for the front of the building. So this meant the only AC unit that we would get is a portable unit for the dining room. Those two units with some box fans made the heat tolerable. However, there was an unintended consequence of the portable unit that made the entitled Grandma Karen lose her mind. When I was at work one day, Karen came knocking on the door and my wife answered. She said that the AC units were making a lot of noise and keeping her grandson awake. He often stayed the night there. This was at the early evening and her grandson apparently couldn't sleep because of the noise. Bear in mind, this was a high-end, brand new AC unit. It wasn't loud, and my wife showed it to her. She said it was over 90 degrees in our condo, so we had to keep it on for the baby. She was drinking her milk, but you could tell she was overheated. Our daughter started crying, so my wife excused herself, and the Karen left. About an hour later, the Karen came back, this time pounding on the door and yelling for my wife to turn off the AC. My wife was dealing with our daughter and didn't want to answer the door with someone reacting like that. She pounded on the door for 10 minutes before giving up. She came back a little while later and again started pounding on the doors and shouting. My wife called me and I quickly came home to deal with this bullcrap. By the time I got home, it was finally cool enough to turn off the AC and open the windows. It was maybe 9 o'clock at night by this point. So I go straight over to Karen's unit and then I knock on the door. She opens it and gives me a dead stare that basically said, what do you want? I ask her, why are you pounding on my door and disturbing my wife and baby? She said that the AC was loud and keeping her grandson up. So I say, and this gives you a right to pound on my door and scream at my wife? I had to leave work to come and talk to you because you were so unhinged. I don't care 
what your problem is, screaming at my wife is not how to deal with problems. I then explained how the AC unit didn't make any loud noises, and I'm not sure what she's hearing. The unit was off by this time, so I couldn't hear anything. I explained the extreme heat issue and how we were managing it, and I gave her my cell number to call me if she has issues in the future. She was to leave my wife alone and never pound on my door like that again. A few days later, we get a call from the HOA and the president went to check it out. She was trying to remain neutral and told me that I had a right to my AC, but that there was a noise, but it seemed like the walls were humming. With this, the only thing I could figure out was the building was crappy enough construction, that the AC was causing a weird vibration that caused the wood to become harmonic. Again, the AC unit made very little noise and had only a slight vibration from the motor. So I put my MacGyver hat on and I went to go to the hardware store. I get a foam kitchen mat, some cardboard, and packing tape. I fold over the mat, put several layers of cardboard in between, and I tape it shut. I basically made a poor man's vibration isolation pad. I put my AC unit on that, I took a picture, and I sent it to Karen and the HOA. I told them we would minimize the AC use, but we had a right to use it and I have taken steps to mitigate the issue. For a while, this seemed to shut down Karen. However, she stopped saying hello and wouldn't look at me in the eye after that. Over the next few months, we had no real issues until we suddenly started hearing tapping sounds on the floor. I figured at first that she was hanging something, <laughs> but no, she was hitting her ceiling with a broom. Apparently, the noise was unbearable. We were walking, no running, jumping, loud music, or dropping stuff, just walking. I went downstairs and talked to her about it, and I told her that we were just walking, and she complained about how loud it was. She even complained to the HOA again, but they figured out it was just the building being a little squeaky in places due to age. Literally nothing we could do about it unless we ripped up the floors. On Thanksgiving, when we had a couple of friends over, our kids were quietly playing in the living room, and we were sitting at the dining room table talking. I got up to get something from the kitchen when she started rapping on the ceiling again. I responded with a loud stomp on the floor, which made her stop. She's the one who decided to move into a bottom floor unit of an older building. We weren't loud people, and even when our daughter was a toddler, she was relatively quiet. Our unit was empty for most of the time she was there before we moved in, so I guess she got used to the quiet. After this, we barely acknowledged each other until we finally moved out a couple of years later. The woman who bought it from us was a single woman, so hopefully they get along better than we did. I mean, I'm a dad, and if you tell my young child you can't have the AC running when it's 90 degrees and they're clearly sweating and in trouble with the weather, no, I am not going to stand for that. As a parent, it is my job to take care of my kids because they're young and they need their dad to do that. So you know what? This Karen did not understand it, even having a grandson. So I don't know. I would stand up to her, definitely, and tell the HOA what she's doing again. What would you do? As we get into the next story, I have to tell you something. Hey, also, I added more stories to the new 24-7 HOA Karen radio a stream on the channel perfect to binge or play for background noise while you sleep check out the link in the description or on the front page of the channel it looks like this this story stands up to the hoa and terrible care and neighbors i 25 male own a lakeside property that was legally and officially given to me by my parents i've been living here for six years and i have some great neighbors along with some not so great ones of all my neighbors, I've only ever had problems with one who lives right next door named Mariette. She first moved in early this summer as she had the former house on her property demolished and rebuilt. My problems started with her over her use of my wood stove and fireplaces. With the temperatures getting colder, I've started to use them daily. My house is not equipped with any form of heating outside of the wood stove and a fireplace. This means that, from fall until spring, I will constantly have them going to keep my place warm. My family never outfitted the home with anything better because it was for weekend trips and we would winterize and leave it when things got cold. My parents thought of adding oil heating when I moved in, however I opposed it because it was a waste of money and I didn't mind splitting logs. Five days ago, after having received my shipment of logs for the fall, I was approached by my neighbor Mariette. She came around asking for my parents, to which I said that they don't live here and that I am the homeowner. She didn't believe me and said that I was too young to be a homeowner before leaving. 
Later that day, I heard a knock at my door and thought it was my girlfriend, so I gave my usual greeting of, hey sweet cheeks, while opening the door. Unfortunately, it was not her, and it was Mariette again, so I apologized quickly, and then I asked what she wanted. Once again, she wanted to speak with my parents, to which, in a more stern tone, I said that I was the homeowner. This time, she finally got it and said that I am violating HOA policy by using wood-burning fireplaces indoors and outdoors. In response, I said that as new as the house looks, I am not a member of the group and that the town permits fireplaces and burning yard waste. She then went on to ask why I even needed them because they do nothing but harm the environment. I went on to explain that, while the house exterior looks new, the house actually has been around since 1930 and still uses a wood stove and a fireplace heating. She didn't believe me yet again and said that she would be back with an inspector. Yesterday, once again, she came with another person who introduced themselves as an HOA inspector. They tried to talk about my fireplaces, but I shut them down immediately and said that I am not a member of their group. The guy then tried to lie by saying that the HOA is in control of all the properties in the area. I immediately called him out on the lie and I said that he is either lazy or a moron for not knowing that I am not with them. We went back and forth one more time before I told them that I will not listen to them and just to stuff it and leave. Do you agree with this comment? You're not the butt OP. If this continues, inform the HOA that if they continue to harass you, you have no issues looking into legal counsel. Also, let your neighbor know that she is not allowed on your property, and if she comes over, she is trespassing. Yeah, OP, I mean, go get a lawyer that will stand up for you because they sure don't have ground to stand on, it sounds like. What would you do? Rental permit drama. HOA in violation of the CCNRs, posted by Lacoy. Back in 2020, I applied for a rental permit in my small community and was placed on the waiting list. I would periodically check my status, and I was consistently told that I was first on the list. Per our CCNRs, there are only four rental permits available. Fast forward to five months ago, I found out that three of four permits were granted to a single person. As soon as I found out, I brought this to the board and explained how unfair it was for one person to have three of four permits in a very small community with less than 40 homes. They essentially told me that there was nothing they could do since the prior board approved it and I would have to wait until a permit became available. Recently, one of the tenants moved out of the rental owned by the person with three of the permits. I then checked Zillow and I found out that the landlord had had the home listed for lease. Per our rules, the rental permit provides a 60-day right to lease. If you're unable to rent your home in that time, then it's passed to the person on the waiting list. If there is no one on the waiting list, then the HOA will grant you another 60-day right to lease. Additionally, the home has been empty for the last month. Per our rules, as soon as a number of rentals drops below four, the person on the waiting list has the right to the permit. I reached out to the board to let them know that the unit had been listed for lease for more than 60 days and that due to only three homes currently being leased, I was entitled to the permit. After almost two weeks, including me sending a follow-up email, the president said he investigated and determined that the current permit holder had a right to the permit. He basically ignored all the facts presented, including listing screenshots and me referencing the CCRs verbatim, and flat out said they would not grant me the permit. At this point, the HOA is blatantly violating their own rules, even when provided with evidence of the violation. Any thoughts on what to do next? Do you agree with this comment? You could see what other things are not being done around the community. Put that together and go to your neighbors. Get them to recall the current president. Then it gives you the chance to run or talk to the new president about getting the option to rent out your home. The other options are to see or consult an attorney since the board is ignoring governing documents. Man, if OP could take over or get a lawyer that knows this stuff, what do you think would happen? Towed by the HOA that I don't belong to with an update posted by OK Volume 9677. I live in a cul-de-sac that was built in the early 2000s. A new developer bought the land around us and developed it a few years ago and created an HOA. Now they own the street that I live on, making it a private street and also own the small parking lots that are a part of the road. I got towed for parking a trailer in the parking lot even though it was the only one of the small lots not marked in the neighborhood. 
none of my neighbors in the original homes in the cul-de-sac elected to join the HOA. But now, we have no overflow parking. I know I likely have a way to get them to pay for the tow since the area was not posted as a tow zone, but I just simply cannot believe this is even possible given our house has been here over 15 years longer than the HOA. More government is never the answer. An update. I called the non-emergency number and they told me that they will likely not be able to make a police report because it was not stolen, just relocated. I have tried calling the county and they told me to call the city. After calling the city, they told me that the street is privately owned and to call the county mediation department that basically wants to settle this like a non-biased third party, which I don't think is my best option yet. I have a feeling that I should have been grandfathered in somehow. I don't understand how a road that was seemingly public until 2020-ish can be privately owned with no vote of mine or even a notice. This trailer was also clearly not abandoned as it was chained to a tree and had a tongue lock on it. Update number two. I have gotten all of the deeds from the title company and will be digging through them to see if I can find where I have been granted deeded access to the road before the purchase of the road by the HOA. You agree with these comments? Call the police. Sounds like theft to me. Absolutely this, and the police is supposed to be informed when they tow a vehicle anyway. They can't just tow it with no warnings. Despite the will, my aunt Karen thinks my parents' property belongs to her by deleted. This happened almost five years ago, and I just got noticed yesterday that my entitled aunt Karen has just died, and I got a call from her husband asking me to attend the funeral next weekend, and I declined as did my older brother, Mark, for the purposes of this story. Karen was my mother's older sister. She constantly interfered in my mother and her children's lives. She never liked my father and always tried to tell my mother that she made a mistake by marrying him. She didn't like the name that my parents picked out for my older brother, and my great-grandmother died the day before I was born. And when Karen found out that they were going to name me after her, Karen freaked out and said that she wanted to name her potential future kid so that my mother couldn't use it. Then she tried to talk her out of it by saying that it's too old fashioned and kids would make fun of me, which they did but for other reasons. She criticized both my brothers and my choice of friends and even complained when I started playing softball because proper ladies didn't play sports and if her daughter ever tried playing a sport she would have her removed from her team. Spoiler, she never had children. The day after my 16th birthday, my parents drove on a business trip down to California and I live in Idaho. My dad said that when they got back he would drive me to the DMV to get my license. He never did because on the drive to California they hit a patch of ice, spun out, crashed and died. I was a wreck for some time after that. I didn't even want to attend my high school graduation later because my parents wouldn't be there. Their will split everything evenly between my brother and I. At the funeral, my parents, who owned their own business, production manager Tim, was talking to my brother and my brother told him that in a couple of weeks he would step in and take over and he was counting on Tim to run things smoothly until then and to help him in taking it over and learning the ropes. I had no interest in the business other than it was a guaranteed summer job when I was growing up, so I stayed out of it and just collected profit checks until I sold my half to Mark, and he continues to run the business to this day. Mark told Tim that he should assure the employees that their jobs were safe and that no major changes would be made. And then, one day, Aunt Karen showed up and began putting her stuff in my parents' office. And when Tim confronted her about this, she said that his services were no longer needed and he was fired. Tim called Mark up and Mark went down with the family attorney, some police, and the necessary paperwork and had her removed while she said that the place was now hers because it was her sister's, so now she was the owner. As long as I have known her, she has never had a steady job and she's had three husbands, not counting the man who called me, never met him, and milked each one for as much as she could get until she divorced him. The next day, I was leaving for school. I walked, it was fairly close, probably around 10 minutes, and saw her car in a moving van parked outside. 
She said she was moving into her house and then said in a sickly sweet voice that for a reasonable rent, she would continue to allow me to stay there until I graduated high school. I went in and I called my brother and he again showed up with the family attorney, police, and all the paperwork and had her removed from the property. I was at school so I didn't get to see what happened, but that night Mark gave me a business card for a policeman who I assume helped deal with all of this and told me that if I ever saw Aunt Karen on or near the property to call that number and report her immediately. Don't even try to confront her or give her a warning, just call. I do know that the movers charged her to move her stuff into the van, drive across town, get turned away, and drive back across town and move her stuff back into her apartment, which she hadn't given notice yet. I got scared to the point that I didn't even like letting our dog into the backyard when I was at school. I used to put her out in the yard to let her play in the fenced backyard while I was in school. For a while, I just put her in the locked and closed garage and then cleaned up her messes when I got home in the afternoon. Eventually, Karen moved to Colorado, where I assumed that she met and married the man who called me and then said that she had died and he couldn't find anyone from her family to attend the funeral. I chose not to tell him about her, politely said, hey, I'm sorry for your loss, but I can't make it. From discussions with Mark, he basically told him the same thing. Outside of myself, Mark, and Mark's infant daughter, I don't think she has any living relatives. I still own the house. Mark gave me his half as part of the deal where I sold him my half of the business, but I still sleep in my bedroom. I refuse to move into what was once my parents' bedroom, the master bedroom. I go to the local university, go Broncos, and still miss my parents and think about them every day. And even though I am 20, 21 in less than two weeks, own a large home, have a lot of money in the bank, I would trade it all to have my parents back. But I don't care about the how or why of Aunt Karen's death. Non-disabled person demands seat from disabled person. Disabled person is ticketed for said seat. Posted by CMurf1960. I am disabled and use a walker. I have season tickets to the local minor league baseball game and I sit in an ADA section at the ballpark. It's on the concourse so I don't have to navigate steps to get to and from the restroom, the concessions, and so on. I have the same seat for every game of the season. It's at the end of the row and there's space for me to put my folded walker. It folds pretty small and then room for me to get in and out even when the wheelchair spaces on the other side of my seat are occupied. Season ticket holders are given a card that the ticket taker scans on the way in. Okay, so one day last week, I was there, sitting in my seat, drinking my beer, waiting for the game to start, when this large group comes along. A few developmentally disabled adults and a lot of non-disabled companions. The row I sit in has 10 seats, four of them are actually wheelchair spaces. The four wheelchair spaces are taken by those who need them. That leaves five regular seats, as the one I am sitting in does not count here. So this able-bodied woman, who appeared to be the leader of this group, came over to me and then asked me to move because I was not ticketed for the seat, that her group had the whole row, so I had to move. I told her that she was mistaken and showed her my season ticket card that has the section, the row, and the seat number printed right there on it. She still would not believe me and then kept demanding that I move. I was about to go and fetch a staff member to resolve the issue when one came over. I've been a season ticket holder at this place since 2011 and I've had this particular seat for two years now. Almost everybody who works there knows me. So this was a battle that the entitled Karen could never hope to win. So the staff member guy tells the entitled Karen to leave me alone, that I'm ticketed for that seat and I don't have to move and showed her where the seats her group was ticketed for are. They did have my whole row except for my seat, but only five of the non-disabled people could sit in the row, and the other four were wheelchairs. The rest of them had seats in the regular seating bowl, in the same section, but right in front of the concourse row. The ADA row is for actual disabled people and a limited number of companions, not for all the non-disabled people in a large group. So entitled Karen relents and leaves me alone, sort of. She's complaining very loudly to her friends that I should have been considerate and given up my seat to her. I ignored her. But wait, there's more. There's a pile of folding chairs in the alcove of the restrooms behind this row, and these people found them and decided to use them to make their own row behind me because they all wanted to sit together. 
Since both the wheelchair spaces to the left of me were occupied, the only access I had in and out was a space about two feet wide. Fine, I can do that. Then another person with a folding chair came along and tried to block off that little space, so I would have no way to get out. I turned around and I told them no, and they backed off. The game was sold out, so there were no other seats for me to move to just to get away from them. I hope I never have to see them again. I completely agree with this comment here, do you? I think it's worth it to complain to the stadium management. Had there been an emergency, this would not have been safe conditions. I smell a lawsuit cooking, do you? You're not disabled, you're just faking it to get attention. The Logic of Gossip, posted by Fred's Red. This happened a few years ago when I was working in a booth in a mall selling phone cases. There's a rumor in my town, no clue how it started, that this guy, Justin, not his real name, is faking being in a wheelchair to get attention and sympathy. I know him personally, and I know that this rumor is not true. He was hit by a drunk driver while crossing a pedestrian crossing 10 years ago and is a paraplegic. I'm a C4 and 5 incomplete quadriplegic, and I can spot a fake disabled person easily. Anyone else with a spinal cord injury will be able to relate. So I was at work and serving a customer when I saw Justin going past in his wheelchair. My customer saw him and scoffed. Can you believe people like that? It's bad enough for people like you, but people like him, he needs to stop faking it. I was shocked and for a second, I didn't know what to say. I was in customer service mode and didn't want to say anything that could make me lose my job. Um, I tried to reply. That's Justin. He's a paraplegic. He's not faking it. Ah, oh, he's fooled you too, you poor girl. Uh, his name is Justin, and he was hit by a drunk driver 10 years ago on this street. He was in a coma for a week, and he lost sensation from the waist down. If you look this up online, you'll find the report of the incident. Please do some research and don't believe everything you hear. She muttered some halfway butt apology and then walked away without buying anything. I want to say that I haven't heard any other conversations about Justin faking it, but it's a small town, and gossip, well, gossip spreads like herpes here. It's been about 13 years since his injury, and for someone that's supposedly faking it, he's kept up the ruse very, very well. The moral of this story? Don't believe everything you hear. Hey, you know what they say, and assuming makes a what out of you and me? <laughs> oh man, this is ridiculous. Sued the HOA. They towed my truck twice off my property with updates. Click the video on your screen so you find the final fallout of this one and I'll see you there.